All right, well, we're gonna go ahead and get started. We are really excited to have everybody here. It happens to be Genetic Counselor Awareness Day. And so appropriately, um, we're having this webinar um, featuring a genetic counselor and talking about genetics and HPP. Um, so I'm really excited to have everyone here for this informational webinar on IVF and uh, family planning and about genetics. So welcome. Um, we're really excited to have Dina Nussblatt with us, um, and I'll introduce her in a minute. Uh, but before we get started, um, I wanted to introduce myself for those who, of you who I haven't met. I'm Deborah Fowler, and I'm the president of Softbones. My son has hypophosphatasia, and I'm really excited to um, bring the experts here tonight to further discuss this important topic that we've had a lot of questions on our boards about. Um, it's super important for us to understand the genetic inheritance patterns of our disease and what we know and what we don't know and how it can help inform future decisions. So um, before we get started, we thought we'd start off with a little poll. Um, so bear with us. Um, oh, go to the poll first, then we'll come back. Um, we're going to ask everybody to look in their chat function and there's a link if you look at the bottom of your screen, there should be a little um, toolbar that says chat. And um, there's a link where you can vote. And so this is a true or false question. I had genetic testing and my genotype is, um, when I look at it, the HPP online database of mutations, this correlates to perinatal HPP. This means I have perinatal hypophosphatasia. So if you could go ahead and click your answers, um, or you can also text. There's a two-step process if you'd like to text us to text your answer. Um, if you could go ahead and vote, that would be great. And then um, we're gonna go back and do a couple housekeeping items while the, uh, the answers are coming in. So we'll go back to the housekeeping slide. So everybody's just muted for the presentation just to make sure that everybody can hear um, and the, the background noise is, is kept under control. Um, just to quickly familiarize yourself with Zoom, there is a toolbar that uh, at the bottom of your screen that if you pull it up, it will have um, a mute button on your left-hand side. When we, at the end of the presentation, we're going to go into breakout rooms. So you'll need to unmute yourself when we go into those rooms. Um, and uh, that way we'll be able to hear you. Um, but you'll be automatically put into those breakout rooms. You don't have to do anything. You just literally keep your screen as it is and you'll be whisked into your breakout room where there will be some hopefully familiar faces to continue the discussion. Uh, if you have any trouble getting into your breakout room, just post in the chat window and we'll be able to see. Um, we're gonna start the presentation. First half hour will be um, with Dina, she'll talk to us about HPP and about uh, genetics. And then we're gonna break out at around 7.30 and go into our, uh, uh, sorry, do the Q&A at 7.30 for about 15 minutes. And then we will go into the breakout rooms at about 7.45. And um, we'll leave those breakout rooms probably open till about 8.30. So you'll have plenty of time to chat. If you have any questions during the course of the presentation, please enter them into the chat window and we will uh, make sure that we ask them during the Q&A session. So let's go back to the question. Um, again, I had genetic testing, here's my genotype. And when I look at the HPP online database of mutations, this correlates to perinatal HPP. This means I have perinatal HPP. So the results are, Maybe, and that's, that is correct. So um, a lot of people think that their genotype, which is their genetic mutation, is going to dictate their phenotype, which is how the disease manifests itself. And one of the big mysteries and challenges of hypophosphatasia is that this is not the case. So genetic mutations do not indicate 
your severity of disease. And it's very confusing, but in that database, what it does is it documents the very first case and the, pre and the um, severity of disease for that first mutation when it was discovered. So it may have been a perinatal mutation when it was discovered, but that may not mean that it's a perinatal uh, mutation for you. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dina Nussblatt. She's the lead laboratory genetic counselor with Cooper Genomics, uh, Cooper Surgical Company. And Cooper Surgical is doing some really cool things with IVF. They have some uh, amazing technology now where they can not only do IVF and select the best embryos, but using artificial intelligence, even select the embryos that have the best chance of success. So they are at the top of technology and the top of their game. So we're really pleased to have her here. She received her bachelor degree of science and biology from the University of Delaware and her master's in genetic counseling from Arcadia University. She's been practicing as a genetic counselor specializing in fertility and embryogenetic testing for over six years. In her free time, she enjoys hiking, traveling, and baking. So Dina, thank you so much for joining us and I'm gonna pass things over to you. Thank you so much. And thank you Softbones for giving me the opportunity to discuss reproductive options for hypophosphatasia. Hmm. Oh, there we go, okay. Um, so a little background about HPP, although I'm sure many of you are aware of this information. Um, HPP is an inherited disorder caused by one or more mutations in the ALPL gene, and it has a couple different inheritance patterns. So the first inheritance pattern is autosomal dominant, which requires only one mutation to show features. This tends to have milder features of HPP, and for someone who um, has the autosomal dominant form of HPP, there's a 50% chance to have a child with HPP. The other inheritance pattern is autosomal recessive, which requires two mutations. And often, um, often uh, parents are each a carrier, so they carry one mutation, and there's a 25% chance to have a child with HPP with the autosomal recessive form. Now, um, as Debbie mentioned, the mutation does not always predict the clinical outcome. There's a spectrum of features for HPP. And I've included a recent article um, that was published by Erin Huggins, who is on this webinar, on the challenges of predicting the clinical outcome based on the mutation. Hey, Dina. Yes. Your audio just is a little bit garbled. I don't know what okay. happened between our test and now, but it's just a little garbled. Okay, thank you. Let's see. Is that better? Yes. Okay. All right. Great. It's not let me letting me um advance. Oh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> So within HPP, uh, there is high variability. So there's, it's highly variable and presents with a wide range of symptoms. The symptoms can vary within the same family and symptoms can evolve over time. So it's very important to have continued care and monitoring. So there are many different options for family building. And this is really what we're going to focus on today with this talk. Um, for individuals and couples at risk to have a child with HPP, here are a few different options. So there's spontaneous conception. And um, with spontaneous conception, there's a few different testing options to see if a pregnancy has HPP. So there's chorionic villus sampling or CVS. This is typically performed around um, 10 to 13 weeks of pregnancy. There's amniocentesis, which is performed around 15 weeks of pregnancy. There's cord blood testing or testing after birth. So cord blood is, is baby's blood. So that's always an option. And there's always the option of no testing at all. Additional family building options are adoption um, and also donor egg, donor sperm, donor embryo, or there's also embryo adoption. 
There's also in vitro fertilization or IVF with pre-implantation genetic testing or PGTM. And of course, there's always the option to not have children at all. So we're going to focus on pre-implantation genetic testing. So this is um, also referred to as PGT. It used to be referred to as PGD, so pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. So um, in literature, if you're, if you're looking it up, it, you may see PGD. But this is where we test embryos for, or we can test embryos for a few different um, things. So we can test embryos for chromosomal abnormalities, such as Down syndrome. And also we can test embryos for inherited disorders, such as HPP. In order to do pre-implantation genetic testing, you would work with a reproductive endocrinologist or an REI and a fertility clinic. In order to do PGT, this does require IVF. So IVF or in vitro fertilization is defined as the fertilization of an egg and sperm outside of the body. And there are six steps to treatment. There's suppression, stimulation, trigger, retrieval, fertilization, transfer, and cryopreservation. Step one is suppression. This is where the ovaries and the uterus are calmed or shut down. Step two is stimulation. So once the ovaries are shut down, they need to be restarted with stimulation medication. These are the injections, which usually takes about 12 days of injections. Step three is the trigger. This is when the egg cells are large enough and then a trigger shot can be used to mature the eggs. Step four is retrieval. This involves a surgical procedure performed in an IVF clinic or fertility clinic under IV conscious sedation. A needle is attached to an ultrasound probe and is injected into each ovary to obtain the eggs. So that's, um, these are the images that we're looking at now with the ultrasound guidance um, and under IV sedation. Step five is the fertilization of eggs with sperm. So it's normal for not every egg retrieved to fertilize with sperm, that's normal. And once the eggs are fertilized, they're now considered embryos. And embryos are monitored for about five days. Step six is the transfer of an embryo back into the uterus. And the remaining embryos that are not transferred are then frozen or cryopreserved for future embryo transfers. So that's the IVF cycle. This is what embryo development looks like. So on um, the day that the eggs are retrieved, they are, they're a zygote and they're fertilized with sperm. And then they advance to the two cell stage, the four cell stage, um, eight cell, morula, and blastocyst. At day three, or the eight cell stage, this is when all of the cells are totipotent. And that means that they, be, they can become any part of, um, of the, any, they can become anything. So they can become um, the placenta, they can become the baby, they can become, you know, the arms, the legs, the heart. At this stage, they're totipotent. They can become anything. Um, and then at four days um, post egg retrieval, so at the morula stage, it's the embryo is starting to compact. And by the time the embryo reaches the blastocyst stage, so this is day five, this is the last image, the cells of the embryo have started to differentiate into what's, what becomes the fetus and then and what becomes the placenta. So if you see, there is this, um, there's the outer ring of blue circles of cells. The, that's the trophectoderm. That is what goes on to help make the sac or the placenta of an embry, embryo or of a pregnancy. And there's that clump of cells in the middle or you know, on that top left side, those are the cells that go on to make the baby. That's called the inner cell mass. So following day five, so around day five when, when it looks like a blastocyst, that's when an embryo would be transferred back into the uterus.
This is the approximate cost of treatment. Of course, it, it um, varies within IVF clinics and centers, um, as well as different labs. But as you can see, IVF and PGT is quite expensive. Um, so this just gives you a little bit of an idea. And insurance does not always cover IVF. Certain states have their own mandatory coverage, but not a lot of them. So what is PGTM? So pre-implantation genetic testing or PGT for a monogenic condition, that's PGTM. And a monogenic condition is, um, is, a, is a specific condition. So this would be embryo testing for a specific condition like HPP. This is where we test cells from an IVF created embryo for an inherited genetic condition. And PGTM gives us the ability to selectively transfer an unaffected embryo or embryos into the uterus. The whole goal of PGTM is to greatly reduce the chance of having a baby with the inherited genetic condition. Some of the steps to, ex um, to explore uh, PGTM is that this, it does require genetic testing and a genetic test report showing the specific HPP mutation. So if genetic testing has not already been done, um, then work with a local genetics professional or genetic counselor to coordinate that testing if you're interested in, in PGTM. You would then meet with a reproductive endocrinologist. This is an REI or the fertility doctor. And a fertility clinic is usually set up with a PGT laboratory. The fertility clinic would then send in a referral order form to the IVF, uh, to the PGT laboratory. And this is the PGTM process. So once the, once the laboratory receives that order form from the fertility doctor and the genetic test report for HPP, then uh, this would go through the case review. And at that point, the reproductive couple would speak with a genetic counselor through the laboratory and discuss the steps for the PGTM process. They'd discuss if any additional genetic testing for the couple or for family members is required, and also discuss DNA samples that are required from the reproductive couple and family members in order to test embryos. Uh, once the appropriate documents and DNA samples are at the PGT laboratory, then a unique PGTM test is prepared. So um, for PGTM, the lab has to design a, a unique test for every family. There's not a set test on the shelf. Embryo testing and PGTM is very different from testing people. And ultimately, it comes down to the amount of DNA that we're working with at the embryo level. It's such a small amount of DNA that a unique PGTM test has to be prepared, has to be designed for every family undergoing IVF and PGTM. Once the laboratory has completed test preparation, then we're ready for the couple to undergo IVF. When, the, um, when there are embryos that reach that day five stage, that blastocyst stage, then an embryologist will, will biopsy the embryos or remove a few cells from each embryo. And those cells, that sample is sent to the PGTM lab to test. The embryos always stay put at the fertility clinic. They never travel. The PGT lab only receives the biopsied cells to test. And the results for each embryo are sent back to the fertility clinic and the doctor um, to discuss which embryo to transfer. So the, as you can see, the PGTM process is quite involved and can take quite some time. This is a little bit more detail about how PGTM works. So it involves a, the close examination of both, oops, 
um, close examination of both the mutation and areas surrounding it. So we look directly at the HPP mutation, and then we have to look at the area surrounding it. So um, a little bit to the left of the mutation and a little bit to the right of the mutation, the area surrounding it. Again, each PGTM test is unique and specific to each family. And it requires a DNA sample from the reproductive couple and often additional family members like children or pregnancies. And um, if, if couples do not have children or pregnancies, then we go up the generation to the future grandparents and often use the future grandparents as well to help with, with preparing a PGTM test. PGTM is ultimately performed through something called linkage analysis, which is used to determine the genetic fingerprint of the mutation to diagnose to diagnose each embryo. So linkage analysis is where we track this pattern or this area surrounding the mutation that moves with the mutation within a family. So we're, it's, this, it's this linked area that's moving with the mutation. And in order to track this linked area or this genetic fingerprint, we often need family members or two generations involved. This is more about the embryo biopsy. So going back to what the embryo looks like at that blastocyst stage um, where on day five, where you can see um, that, that inner clump of cells, that goes on to make the, the um, baby. And there's that outer ring of cells that goes on to make the sac or the placenta of a pregnancy. So once a PGTM test is prepared and the lab is ready to test embryos, the embryologist would remove a few cells from the trophectoderm, from that outer layer, which is the image at the bottom of the screen. So a few cells are removed from the trophectoderm, which would make the, the sac or the placenta of a, of a pregnancy. And those cells are sent to the PGT lab to test. Often a question I get from couples who are doing this is, you know, because some cells are being removed from an embryo, is there an increased risk to have a baby with missing fingers or toes? And the answer is no. And that's really because those cells being tested would go make the sac or the placenta. They're not removing cells that would go make the baby. Those biopsied embryo samples are sent to the PGT lab to test. And the embryo results typically take about two weeks or so. And the results are sent back to the fertility clinic to discuss with you if you were interested in doing this. You would then work with your doctor to decide which embryo to transfer to the uterus if there are any embryos available. Then you would undergo a blood test at the um, fertility clinic about two weeks later to see if you are pregnant. Some common misconceptions that I often hear is, you know, if, um, is about the number of embryos available for transfer. So if this is recessive, if this is the recessive form of HPP, then 25% of the embryos would have HPP. Um, and, and for the dominant, same thing. If this is the dominant form of HPP, then about 50% of the embryos would have it, HPP. Now, we don't always see this, this breakdown, you know, what we would expect. And that's really because we test such a small sample size of embryos. If we tested 1,000 embryos per couple, sure, we would probably see this breakdown. But we test such a small sample size, so we sometimes don't see this. Another common misconception that I hear is, you know, I don't have any fertility problems. We are only doing this to reduce the chance of having a child with HPP. So if I have an embryo that's available for transfer, then of course I'm going to get pregnant. The pregnancy rate is 100%. And that's also not always the case. Um, you know, there's lots of factors that go into a pregnancy, not only the genetics. 
So it's important to be, you know, to have realistic expectations um, if undergoing IVF and PGTM. Some considerations are that you know, IVF and PGTM is not right for everyone. It's certainly an option, and I'm glad I'm able to present this um, and give a little bit more information about this, this option, but it's not right for everyone. And there are other considerations to think about too. You know, are you even a candidate for IVF? Um, a lot of it comes down to how's egg quality, how's sperm quality, um, age-related factors. You know, could um, there's a lot of hormonal differences. So not everybody responds well to the fertility meds, even if they don't have an underlying fertility um, or infertility. And is the mutation technically amenable to PGTM? Often, we can test embryos for, for the majority of conditions, for the majority of mutations. But sometimes, and rarely, the specific mutation and the specific family structure um, yields limitations that technically the lab is unable to test embryos. Something to think about also is, you know, if you, if you did IVF and PGTM, what would you do if all the embryos had HPP? Would you undergo another IVF cycle to try to test more embryos? Would you, um, would you consider transferring an embryo with HPP, knowing that the mutation does not um, tell us the clinical picture? And, and, you know, we can't predict the features or severity of HPP in the embryos. We can only say if the mutation is present or absent. We can't predict the, the clinical picture. So I hope this presentation provided you with some information about the option and possibility of IVF with PGTM. So I'm happy to take questions. Thanks, Dina. Super informative. Um, we did get a couple questions. Um, one of them was in reaction to the price. Um, and the question was, um, you know, it looks expensive. Um, does insurance cover any parts of IVF or PGT? So it, it certainly depends on everyone's own insurance. I know some companies, some insurances are starting to provide fertility coverage um, and different states also have their own mandated fertility coverage. So IVF might be covered, but PGT, but embryo testing might not be, but IVF is a significant portion of the cost. So one or the other, um, sometimes when trying to get um, embryo testing covered, a letter of medical necessity from um, a local genetic counselor or geneticist or, or physician is sometimes helpful when getting, um, getting testing covered or right. you know, partially reimbursed. Um, Another question that uh, was submitted was, when is a good time to talk to a genetic counselor? You know, some people, I guess, are, you know, potentially um, not, maybe not in a phase where they may be thinking about family planning. Um, what's your recommendation? Um, any, really any time. I don't think there's a wrong time to talk to a genetic counselor, um, to, you know, to get a feel for, I'm not there yet, but what might be my options or what, what do I need to think about if I'm interested in this in five years, 10 years, or what should I know if my child is interested in this? So mm -hmm. I don't think there's a wrong time um, to talk to a genetic counselor. Just knowing your options ahead of time and talking about it ahead of time so you're not rushed is always important. And are genetic counselors, are they typically covered by insurance or is it something you have to have a prescription for? Um, also depends on your own insurance. Um, I think a lot of insurances require um, a referral from a primary care physician in order to see a genetic counselor. But if you have, but if HPP is running in your family, then you could speak with one. Um, or, or, you know, if you're, if, or, you know, if you found out you're a carrier for HPP, you yourself don't have features, but maybe you and your partner are both carriers, you know, you can speak with a genetic counselor at that point as well and talk about options and, and risks. But, um, 
but I mean, some in, some insurances, you don't even need a referral necessarily to speak with a genetic counselor. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot more telehealth um, right. going on as well. So you may not even need to see one in person. Right. Um, two more questions. Um, one is, what are the options for future use of the embryos with HPP that are not implanted? Sure. So um, I have heard about donating embryos for research. Um, I don't specifically know of any um, companies, labs uh, who are working with it, but I'm sure I'm sure there's HPP research going on. So, uh, so sometimes those research facility, facilities are interested in obtaining those embryos and, and doing additional research. Um, another question was, um, my child has HPP and her spouse doesn't, are there guarantees that I will have an embryo without HPP? So this one's a little bit challenging of a question to answer, especially because they, um, you know, I, I don't know if there's two mutations, one mutation, I don't know if it's, you know, dominant or recessive, which could change potential inheritance, um, of it, mm-hmm. but um, but I think it's, it may be smart to speak with a genetic counselor and discuss the reproductive risks specifically for, for your family. Maybe you could talk about if it's recessive or if it's dominant. Oh, sure. The yeah, sure. So um, if this individual has, the, has one mutation, has features, um, then you know, we would expect about half of the embryos to inherit that mutation as well. And so, um, so IVF and PGTM is, is of course, is an option and is available to look for that one mutation. If it's recessive, so this individual has two mutations and her spouse does not have, um, or, is, or screen negative, was not identified to have any mutations, um, then th- there would be a 100% chance to pass on one mutation. Um, but, regarding those specific mutations and if one mutation could cause mild features, I, I, I don't, I don't know because of the genotype phenotype correlation. We're not sure. Okay. There's actually another question, um, that just came in, um, about carrier screening, um, saying that, you know, we, they've had carrier screening before for cystic fibrosis. Is that something they may start to screen for people who have HPP or other diseases? I I know it's pretty well known about cystic fibrosis, but I I don't know the answer to that. What what about other diseases and potential carrier screening? Sure, so carrier screening has um, evolved a lot to involve, um, many times it's called expanded carrier screening now, where they used to do it based on ethnicity, um, where if you were Jewish, you would have this, you know, a subset of conditions that you were screened for. If you were African American, you would test for a specific condition. Now, because everyone's ethnicity is so mixed that they have um, expanded carrier screening, which um, has hundreds of conditions, you know, 100 to over 200, over 300 conditions that are screened for. Um, different labs are screening for different conditions, and hypophosphatasia is um, a condition that is screened for um, by at least a, a couple labs who do expanded carrier screening. Great. Very good. I'm just um, going to make a quick call for any last questions. We're a small group, so you can feel free to unmute. You don't have to type it in the chat window. Okay. Dina, thank you so much. Thank you. It was so nice um, speaking with everyone and uh, getting this opportunity. Thank you. Thanks so much.